You like beef and I meat? I love beef, man. Love I love meat. a good steak. You? No. No. Mm-mm. You went vegan a while ago, right? Yeah, I'm vegan now, but I can't. You know what? When I was eating meat, when I eat a lot of meat, it hurts when I fucking shit. I can't shit when I eat a lot of meat. I can't fucking shit. You know what I think the solution to that is? What? Don't eat meat. You know what? If I can't fuck shit, but if I can't shit, fuck. (laughs) Fuck. Hey everybody, welcome to a special edition of Hot Boxing. I'm Evan Britton. And I'm Mike Tyson. Mike, we got a great guest today, man. Awesome guest. Exciting. Very awesome. This is very interesting guest we have. Here. Yeah, it takes a lot to get me out on a Saturday morning I love to do that. a podcast. Thank you. And we not just a podcast, that. but also to Hotbox. But I would like, I do this, I, you know, I come in here Sunday midnight, you know, three in the morning. Tell me where when you, to come. I'm here. You from? I love that. John Heileman, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, guys. It's just awesome to be here. This is, I've been looking forward to this day ever since we started talking about doing it. So here we are. And I grew up here, man. I yeah, grew up, not, not in El Segundo, but uh, in fact, you know, my dad moved here. From, uh, from for the Midwest in the late 50s. He was from Milwaukee. And he when he moved out to California, the first job he had when he moved to L.A. was working for Litton Industries, a, a aerospace firm in El Segundo. So uh, we are, we're like, this is like, feel like, feels like I'm in my ancestral spiritual home. But I grew up in the valley, out in the far west valley, out near, yeah. in uh, Canoga Park. Nice, um, man. So that's my, uh, that's awesome. my, and I was here for the first 18 years of my life and then left and, um, have not lived here since, but I come back a lot. So LA always feels like my my original. Where do you live now? I live in New York City. Okay, yeah, love it out there now. Huh? So you know, I, I moved from here, your your current home, to your old home. And in yes. fact, I lived my first place. I lived in uh, when I moved to New York in two thousand two, two thousand three, was in Fort Greene. That's why I was Ooh, born. Ooh, that's born where my dad Greene. lived. Yeah, so Cumberland I, Hospital. Yeah, so I lived right on yeah. the park, right on on Washington, Washington Park. Right on Washington Park. Yeah. I lived on. I lived on at two hundred nine Washington Park yeah, on the no corner. No shit, my dad lives at two hundred eight Washington Park. Oh, no, 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 fuck, that's that's crazy, man. That's that's amazing. Oh, yeah. Oh no. So my wife and that's I lived. My wife and I trip. lived there, right on the corner of, of Washington of Washington Park and DeKalb, like right and across, yes. right across. From I used the to park. live on the Franklin between DeKalb and Willoughby. And that's that's and you know that park as you. You know, man, like now it's all gentrified. And so yeah. you, the park is great. You can go and hang out there with the dogs and everybody all day, all night. It's great. And it's beautiful. And 15 years before, 20 years before, you could not go in that park. I remember park. around 1977, they were filming a movie. That, I don't know. It was around 77, 76, I guess, with Education of Sunny Carson or something. And they had all the gang fight um, pictures in Washington Park. Mm. A little kid, we all went down there. Yeah, wow. And that's uh, it used to not be that. It, it, that was not a. Uh, that was not a place you went at night. No, scary. Not not a Real place. Scary. North Portland Avenue, South Portland. Yeah, it's cra- it's cra- it's crazy how that that all that whole part of Brooklyn. You know, the Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, yeah. Bed Stuy. If you listen, if you weren't like um white or Puerto Rican or Italian, you better not go around there. Yeah, right now, you know? not not the case now. It's yeah, like no. it's nice. It's actually one of the great like as that's that there, there's some places in Brooklyn that obviously totally gentrified, but that neighborhood. Still, that whole complex over there, Bed Stuy, Clinton Hill, uh, Brownsville. Browns, those yeah. are, yeah, Brownsville still bad. has the Brown, yeah. that, that. <laughs> We can't, we got to change the name. Yeah, right. <laughs> the name is bad. It's just bring, it, it brings up so much stuff from the past. But it's bad. a nice mix over there. A lot of Brooklyn now, it's like you got yeah. these nice neighborhoods where it's like, you know, half, you know. You don't have to worry about somebody snatching your head off or something. That's that's true. And that's a, that's probably a good thing. But you 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 lived there when it was a lot tougher. Holy mm. moly. Listen, when I go to NASA, was my life a lie? Yeah. Was that actually true? Did I live like this? This is not a place that somebody that had nothing and ways on welfare and it's, it's just unbelievable what they did there. How do you like California? California is God's country. Yeah. How long you lived here now? <laughs> I lived here before. I, I, I moved. I moved back here a year ago, but I lived here before in 80, 87. Right. And you, and you moved back out here when? Um, last year. Last year. Yes. Right. And so you're and you're this is it. You're here. You're you're done. Your California is going to be your home forever now. It appears that way, but I don't know. You what, look, you look pretty. At, you look at home here. I am at home here, but you just never know what um, the energy has in store for you. He's got this shirt. That's a that's like that's a shirt of a person who's like who's that's a cat. Who's guy. that's a, that's an L, that's an L A shirt is what that is, right? Big yeah. guy. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Evan. You're welcome, <laughs> man. Um, I did the opposite. I was born in New York City. Yeah. Lived in Park Slope till I was ten. Then my mom moved my brother and I out to L A. 
went lived in Burbank. Burbank, right down the 101 from you, man. Yeah. Listen, if you lived in New York, you wouldn't have this zen energy, man. You'd be a great. I know, I know. I might have just turned into a weed dealer <laughs> if I had stayed. It's be, it's. I think it's the better the path. I mean, like I I think that they, both places are great and they have great energy and it's kind of great too. I don't know. I've, I always feel like I. I have become such a New Yorker, but I still have that California thing like down, you know, it's like people in New York still, there's like the, you gotta, you gotta have a metabolism to live Absolutely. in New York, right? You gotta have a sort of metabolism, high energy, high energy right? But, yeah. but then the question is, is there at the bottom of that, is there stress and tension or are you basically, Connected. or are you basically chill, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think coming from California and living in New York, it's like, there's a, you know, you keep, my metabolism is pretty high, but there's also like this, I still have like the California that core, I, I still have that. this. I still have this California bottom. That you know resonates I mean? with me. Yeah, for you know sure. what I mean. Yeah, it's like I think you meet people who like who can work in both places. There's people you meet yeah. in L.A. who could never hack Handle. New York. Yeah, and you meet people in New York who could never hack Cal yeah. in L.A. They'd just be like they're lose they're, their minds, lose their minds, yeah. right? But yeah. if you have that, then there's this kind of category of person who can play in both places and yeah. like feels comfortable in both places. And yes. I, that's a good that's a good vibe. People, I vibe with that too. Yeah, people totally. in New York um, are so amazed how friendly the people out here are. Yeah. Say, wow, people in California are so cool. You know, you could talk to them. You don't know them. You can say hi to them. You would not say hi to somebody in New York if you don't know them. Yeah. How you doing? They just walk right by you. Yes, they mm. might get, who the fuck are you? <laughs> what? You hitting on me, motherfucker? <laughs> you know, New York is weird. You, if you don't know them, don't say They don't have time. Them. Yeah, don't say anything. People don't have time. I think I think most people, if you came up and said, hey, they'd probably say, oh, they'd yeah, probably say sure. hi. Yeah, listen. When it I was, was you. Um, this what happened one day. I was yeah. um came back to my old neighborhood. I was 14 at the time, right? And I was living with Cuff, so I had probably a year or two. So I have a whole different life reaction than back in black Brownsville. So I'm in Brownsville, and some guy on the street where I'm with my friend, and he said, what's up? I said, hey, what's up, man? Because I'm used to being, now everybody knows me. I fight, and everybody says hi to me upstate New York. So I come to here, and this guy says hi to me. Hey, he said, hey, how you doing? And my friend said, yo, Mike, you know him? I said, nah. I said, what you say hi to him for? I said, I don't know. The fuck that nigga. Don't say hi to that motherfucker. And that's just how it was. Wow. You don't know him. Don't talk to him. And your friend was still in the Brooklyn well, mindset. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the kind of lifestyle it was. Yeah. Don't say hi to somebody you don't know. Yeah, dude. I remember this that. This guy might be trying to hit on you or something. Yeah. And this that's the mindset. I mean, in L.A., you might try to say hi to somebody and they might be totally emotionally shut down. <laughs> but, you know. Dead. They're still. Dead, dead at this. Like, dead, yeah. dead at the level of soul. Just yes. completely dead soul. Yeah. But like, a soul, least... like a soul. Like a zombie soul. <laughs> yeah. You know? Like the, this, yeah. like the soul to... of one of those zombie dragons but, but you have in Game to, of Thrones. It's true. Kind of thing, we have yeah. totally it's two true. different coaches. Yeah. yeah. It's totally two different. Totally different. <laughs> uh, but similar in certain aspects. I think there's a, a level of thinking happening in both cities. Yeah. That, you know, is very high level. New York is this way. Well, well it's funny. LA like, is this way. Well, just yeah. on like, just, <laughs> even, just, I mean, just even like you think about on the, if you go, yeah, I lived, I lived, so I grew up here and then I've lived in a bunch of places. I lived in Washington, D.C., and Chicago, and London, and, uh, and Boston, a bunch of places. And then at one point, I went up and lived in San Francisco for about four years, um, like 1998 to 2002, right before I moved to New York. And what's cool is, um, and the thing that you're saying, I think that is true, if you think about these big, broad uh, social change, you know, whether it's like, whether it's legalizing cannabis or gay marriage or the environmental movement or whatever, like big, like big things that have changed the country. Um, a lot of them start here, you know, it's like mm. in a, a lot of them in Northern California and to some extent in Southern California, where the social, the, the progress takes root in California and California is, you know, 10, 20 years ahead of the rest of the country. And then the sort of next, the East coast, which everybody thinks of being as super liberal. Everybody thinks California is super liberal too. But it's even though they're both liberal politically, the, the change often starts here and then sort of gets adopted by other progressive minds outside of California. So it's like California is like the birthplace of a lot of I would those say big changes. I would say that 100%. Yeah. It and that is the black power movement. Right. Of, yeah. Mm. California. Yeah, totally. Mm. Yeah. You think about all the shit in the late 60s that came out of that Northern California scene, whether it was like the free speech movement, the black power movement, the, 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 yeah, the, 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 the environmental movement, computers, you know, and all the stuff around people taking control over their lives through technology, you know, the notion of personal 
technology and the yeah. ability to like you know use these big computer systems to come to this where to, we have this where it's individual right yeah. that's like that's a huge social change too and a lot of that stuff took root up there and then you know eventually kind of like the the thing starts on the west coast and gets adopted then on the east coast and then eventually washes over the rest of the country when you know when it gets more broadly uh, more broadly embraced. Uh, but that's why I think there's something in common between uh, California and, and New York, even though they're totally different in yeah. the vibe of the place and yeah. a lot of the, the metabolism is different. It's still the openness to new ideas, you know, tends to be, you see that, that's the thing that holds LA and New York are kind of in common. You get those places that are willing to embrace change in a way and then kind of push the boundaries of what's what's considered conventional or acceptable. And, you know, it's still the case that cannabis isn't legal in New York state, you know, which is, know. you know, you think everybody says New York is like the most liberal place in the country. Right. It, but it's, but, you know, they're still behind on some stuff like that. You know, we'll, we're going to get there and it's not going to be, it's not very far off now, but it's not, it hasn't been at the forefront of that change. What do you think about in New York City the stop and frisk situation? They still have that now that they stopped that. Yeah, they stopped that. You know, it was uh, <laughs> they stopped. They stopped that. You know, De Blasio moved away from that. I think you know it was. Uh, you know, you think about the period. It's very Gestapoist. Yeah. yeah. You it, know. It was yeah. not. It was not. You know. You think about the three terms that Mike Bloomberg had as mayor were really good for the city in a lot of ways, and there were a lot of things that were. Um, you know, the city got better in in almost every way that you could that you could measure. But there were a few things that were still fucked up that needed to change, and I think that was one of them for sure. Mm. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's a it, it, you know, there, there's it takes time to change some stuff. You know, yeah. I mean, for I, sure. You know, that's a that's of course a, a a Giuliani thing. You know, from from where it started mm. was back before that, and you know, just uh, uh, it, it's a pretty good place now. You know, it is. New York's a pretty good place. It definitely is. It's a mecca when I go there. I get to visit probably once a year. And you said you grew up in Park Slope? Yeah. Born in Park Slope? Yeah. Well, born at St. Vincent's yeah. in New York City and, you know, then grew up in Park Slope. So you and Mike basically have like Brooklyn, have kind of like Brooklyn, yeah. Brooklyn, Brooklyn, that. Brooklyn DNA in common. Yes. That's why do. you guys are doing this podcast together. That's how we came together. I think so, like, yeah. You guys have the 718. Yeah. Down in deep in your, deep in your, in your gut somewhere, yes. you got the 718. Absolutely. Okay. The 718. 718. Big That's time, it. bro. That's it. Brooklyn. Time. It's the funniest thing when I lived, we, I lived in Brooklyn for, from, for 10 years, more than 10 years. And what happened in those 10 years from 2003 to about when I left in 2016. So I was there 13 years. Wow, fuck. Um, a long time. Um, I forgot it was that long. Um, I, made it, I might have been stoned for part of that time. It's possible. Um, but what happened was Brooklyn became this big brand. You know, you think about when you grew up there, right? Like Brooklyn was like Manhattan was the shit. And, yeah. and the outer boroughs were the outer boroughs. And, exactly. But people thought Brooklyn was like less, right? And then Brooklyn, exactly. and then Brooklyn got super trendy, right? So it's like that whole... The brownstone Brooklyn thing that was, you know, the Cosby family made that as a television show made really famous. And then Williamsburg, where I lived for a long time, became like the capital of hipster Brooklyn. So you would go to like Amsterdam or Paris or wherever, you know, Copenhagen, and people talk about Brooklyn now. Like Brooklyn is like, yeah. for yeah. a lot of people around the world, Brooklyn is cooler. Very hip. Is cooler in their minds than Manhattan is. For sure. New York Magazine, at some point in the middle of that, they did a thing about how uh, about Brooklyn being, you know, the new Manhattan, you know, and Manhattan's trying to catch up to Brooklyn because, like, if you were, you know, the the the, the combination of it's so you know more racially diverse and all that kind of artisanal shit going on. That's and yes. all great, but listen, all that stuff is great going on. I'm still apprehensive about living there. Yeah, really. My past, my past experience make me apprehensive. I don't care how beautiful that place looks. Right. Huh. You know, just whoa, be so careful. I, so if I took you back to Park Slope and we walked you down the street, well, I know Park what Slope, it looks like, right? But you're walking down the street with a bunch of people with strollers. You'd still be like, you'd still have the, <laughs> the clenched up. You'd be like ready for a fight. No, I'm just saying anything can happen. Yeah, people can just, in Brooklyn yeah. they just drive by in cars, get out of cars. They don't do no no drive by, but they get out of cars and start trouble. People, New York people, yes, anything people see you is just weird. <laughs> You know what I mean? I know Brooklyn for being violent. Yeah, you know you're on Park yeah. Slope and you're not and you um. And you're not Italian, you're dead. Mm. You know, you're dead. If you're in um, Howard Beach, you, um, you're black, you're dead. Yeah. 
It's hard to, I think it's hard to get over like when you have a, the formative experience of your life where you have a certain kind of, like you grew up someplace, it kind of doesn't matter if the place changes a lot. You still, no. it's still. I've seen them dead bodies on the streets. Yeah. You know, you never forget that. Mm. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's, it's when hard. When I go there, I said, wow, I remember he got shot here. I remember they threw that, um. Big boat off the roof, on the refrigerator off the roof on the, on the cop's car here. And, you know, wow, this place is beautiful. White people live here now. Holy shit. That's how I think. I said, holy shit. I even saw that, are you white man? She said, yes, I am. I'm saying she's talking shit and everything. So I'm saying, whoa. They own the neighborhood now. It's just a trip. How did it change like that? Must have been fucking weird for you to do the Broadway show, right? Hey, um, Yeah. Cause I was um, when I was a kid, right down the street is where I would snatch people's chains, or snatch their pockets out their wallet, or people on the street was. After I did it, that next day I would come by, and the people that owned the store, so you little motherfuckers, start throwing things at me or chasing me because they saw me snatch the chain the other day. And now I walk down the street, everybody, says, Mr. Tyson, Mr. Tyson, gotta get your autograph, Mr. Tyson, Mr. Tyson, Mr. Tyson, and that's really freaked me out. What a trip! Yeah, it really freaks me out. What a trip! It's, it's like, uh, I mean. You can't escape your past, right? No, I, I don't try to escape it. No, I mean just in general, people. I don't mean you, yeah. but I mean just in general, yeah. your past is your past. Like yeah. you have it's those, there. Asso- those associations when the stuff that like that like your idea of what what a place is like from when you grew up is so powerful. How much yeah. how it leaves those impressions. They're never going to go away. Like somewhere, no matter what it looks like, no matter how much has changed, you still have the thing of like this is what it was like when I was when I was coming up, right? And that's, what was that movie? Um, when the old man had old, and the little kid had the old man. He said, May I have more, sir, please? What was the name of that play? You remember that play? Mm. He asked for more, but the guy was the kind of guy, he had all the little kids, they lived in London, he had all the little kids go out and steal and bring the money back to him. Um, it's a Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens, yeah. Um, but that was my Al- life. Oliver, Oliver, Oliver Twist. Twist. Oliver yeah. Twist. Yeah. Yeah. Oliver like, Twist. We had, our, we had our parents. We had our parents' friends. And our job was to rob people. My parents, my um, my mother would have a boyfriend. I have a man. I don't know if it was a boyfriend. I never saw him before. Have a man come, have sex with a man. We would rob him. We cut his pockets. We, you know, rob him. Then have an older guy come up here and throw him out. Or something like that. What you doing with my woman? It was just everything was a scam. Everything was about beating the system. My whole life was um, fucking um, consistent about beating the system or the white men or whoever it was that owned this world. And we were fucking um, subservient people, but we had to come up some kind of way. I had no idea that I was just poor and I was uneducated. I didn't know what to do. And I didn't know how I got put in this world. What was my crime? Man. What do you think, John? I think, you know, I think that your story is like one of the great American stories, mm. is what I think. I mean, I I was watching, I watched on the way out here uh, two movies that I'd seen before, but I watched them again just for the hell of it because I thought it'd be cool to watch them. I watched the Toback movie and then, the, and then Spike's movie. And just thinking about the, you know, I think the... I mean, I, you, you got a lot of life in front of you. You, you and I were born like six months apart, right? You were born 66, yeah. right? So June? June 30th. So January 23rd, 66. So we're six, you're six months younger than me, yes. basically, right? So you got a lot of life still ahead of you. We hope we're going to be around for a while longer. So who knows where the story goes. But just this part of it, you know, you think about where you came from, what you lived, the good and the bad, right? Just the whole arc of it. It's just a great, you know, if you think about America, in the second half of the 20th century and you know now into the 21st century the the story you lived from that description of your childhood through you know the rise the fall the rise the fall you've had a couple of rises a couple of falls it's a fucking great story i mean like i again it's the good the bad and the ugly but like as a as a story of 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 overcoming adversity of reaching the highest heights you know and and then having to suffer various kind of challenges and setbacks and overcoming those and getting to where you are it's like it's a you know the story is the ending has not been written like i said you got a lot more to go but if you were going to write like about a great you know you're thinking about a like what would be a, among the many great american novels that could be written this is a great it's just a it's a fantastic it's a fantastic journey you're on. That's you what know, I think. That's, what I, that's what I think. It's an incredible. It's an incredible. It's an incredible that, right? fucking tale. Is what it is. It's interesting that you said it because um, life is um. I don't know, I explain it like this. What I said, like I know somebody that grandmother was a slave. I've known somebody who was old enough, and his grandmother was a slave. So I'm saying, and he knew his grandmother, and he knew me. 
So this man knew a slave, and he knew me. Wow, the distance between the two, it seems so far away, but it's not. Yeah, it was like, it was one of the things Chris Rock talked about. Excuse I remember me. a few years ago, that's cool. A couple years ago, Chris Rock did an interview somewhere that I saw where he talked about how his grandmother, I think his grandmother, but not his mom, I think, but I think it was his grandmother who, in South Carolina, like within his lifetime, his grandmother used to have to go when she would get, uh, when she would have to have dental work done she would have to go to the veterinarian mm. in South Carolina because like no dentist would see a black person. So if she had to get a tooth pulled or something, she'd have to go to the, den- the veterinarian to get the dog, to get her, to get her tooth pulled, right? Oh yeah. And that was like, but that's like a thing where you're like, it's like Chris Rock and it's like, this was, he did this thing, it was maybe four or five years ago, I remember reading this interview, but just to your point about like, he's like, you know, my grandmother used to have to go to the veterinarian to get a, to get a, a, a tooth pulled, right? That's like within my lifetime, that's how fucked up things listen, were. Listen, no, um, yeah. This is interesting. This is very, this is, what we do. do you know the scar? This has happened, this is the grandmother, but it left a scar on him. Yeah, right, totally, yes. You don't even know this woman probably, Yeah. but it left a scar on him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's how it is in all, um, I don't know, I know definitely black communities, we're scarred from the past, you know. Most of our pain, the pain from the past, you know, and we, um, we internalize them to the future, you know. I mean, that's the other thing. I think if you've lived your life, you just got an incredible number of stories too. Like, just I'm a great, you know, I love story. I'm a storyteller, right? So, you know, I think about just having lived, you know, the things that people are obsessed with in America, right? They're obsessed with money. They're obsessed with fame. They're obsessed with winning. They're obsessed with celebrity. They're obsessed with a lot of, that's a lot of stuff that American culture is obsessed with, right? You at various times have been at the absolute pinnacle of all those things, right? The greatest winner in your, in your thing that you competed in, in your sport, you know, made a shitload of money, lived at the highest level of glamor, celebrity, fame, fortune, media attention, tabloid culture, going to prison. Like, I mean, all the shit that we're all obsessed with at one time or another, you've been the at the absolute top of the mountain, or the 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 you know going to prison at the absolutely you know the depth of the val- the valley, you know. And again, people are obsessed in this country with prison too, right? Like we people watch fucking prison shit on television all day long. You just have lived this like, you know, for all the categories of things people obsess about, you have had some experience with, and not just an experience with, but like the most extreme experiences with. And I just like, when I hear you tell the stories you tell, the memories you have, good and bad, I just think like, it's kind of crazy that you've been at the center of so many of the different, like things that people in this country spend hours and days and months like that's just obsessed interesting, with. That's right? interesting Absolutely. too that you say that because all these things you see, all these pinnacles of success, all these um, Zenith and all this stuff, all I experienced, and then I experienced a total and none of it meant anything. Right. I haven't seen nothing. Right. It's nothing. It doesn't exist. Yeah. I haven't been anywhere. Yeah. I haven't made my first step yet. So when, do, when does it happen yet? When I die, do I start living then? Now that's where my mind is. What happens when I die? It's a good, this, qu- it's a good this, question. This, That's what I can't answer. To this energy that I have, like the energy you have right now Even in your mind. Yeah, that. What, whatever it is. Evan. What happened? Yeah. What Evan. happened? I'm sorry. What Evan? happened with yeah. that energy? Did the energy die? It's okay. it's okay. Huh? Did the energy die? Did this energy we have, it just go black out and die? Or does it, you know, does it travel somewhere into a bug, a butterfly, a rock, a tree? What do you think? John, you know about I the don't, toad? I don't have a clue. I know about the toad, and you know, um, I do. And it, I, it, it's a... I think all of the – this is a, another category. Who of the, are you, John? Who, who am I? Where you came from? What's your purpose, John? <laughs> Those are good questions. I got the toad right here in front of me, or at least a version of the toad. Yeah. So I think, you know, it was funny. I was just literally on TV a couple days ago talking to, um, uh, to this guy – uh, who wrote this book? Do you know this guy, Michael Pollan? Yes. You know who that is? Yeah, I'm just finishing How to Change Your Mind. Right. So, Pollan is, you know, a famous, uh, famous writer, lives up in Northern California, and had written most of his career about food and, and, and particularly about vegetables. Like, right, has written, uh, wrote this book called The Omnivore's Dilemma uh, and, and yeah, wrote. Great and, nutritional. Yeah. Writing. So, the dude's, a, so the dude's like very, he, and he got interested in psychedelics. 
because of his interest in, in plants, like as a, as a as nutritionally and otherwise, but he's obsessed with plants, right? So, and he's written huge best-selling books. The Omnivore's yeah. Deliver was a, was a giant number one New York Times bestseller for a long time. So he wrote this book that you've read or are almost through. Yeah. And I'm sorry about the name thing. It's it takes, good, it always man. takes me two. Dude, it's tries. my cross to bear. It takes me two, know? but it always takes me two times. We just met. So I got, I'll never fuck it up again. Thank you. Um, but he wrote, so he's written this book about uh, about the psychedelic movement now, like where it is now, not the 60s version, not tune in, turn on, drop out, not like the, and that there's right. like a lot of legitimacy to that too. But he gives a little history of that, which I thought which was is helpful. Cool. Yeah. But, but it's funny because his book um, is about the fact that the, to a large extent, about what's going on with uh, the increasing acceptance in the medical community of the therapeutic benefits of various kinds of psychoactive drugs. So mm -hmm. it's like from, from MDMA, ecstasy, yeah. to organics like psilocybin and the toad and other like organic ibogaine, other stuff yeah. that people take that grow yeah. out of the ground. But all of that stuff, which was, you know, demonized for a really long time. And to some extent, LSD still is. Yeah. Um, but all of that stuff, which was demonized by the culture for so long, now it's starting to change yeah. and and it's starting to change because of a relatively small number of people who were who have fought this fight for years and years a friend of mine when i was uh, at i went to harvard as a graduate student at the kennedy school of government i see you and um i'm ah <laughs> <laughs> i say that though not to be not to brag but just because i met a guy there in 1988 whose name was rick doblin oh yeah of course head so, of maps Head of MAPS, so Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies. And Rick had started MAPS a couple years earlier when I met him in 88. Mm. And so I've known that guy now 40, that's 30 years, 30, over 30 years I met Rick. And Rick at, in 1988 was talking about how MDMA, mm. psilocybin, marijuana to a lesser extent, but he was mostly focused on the psychedelics, yeah. had these potentially huge therapeutic benefits for terminal cancer patients, for uh, soldiers with PTSD, for all that stuff, right? And this was 1988, yeah, okay? Yeah, wow. In 1988, it's we crazy. were- I thought in 1988, there was no way that, that weed would ever be legal. There was still a huge <laughs> thing that you had to decide in 1988 if you went to get a job someplace like- Am I gonna allow myself to be drug tested? That was like the fucking war on drugs. Yeah, that was, was the thing back then. I don't want to know. I got drug tested. No drugs. <laughs> right, but that was the but that was the big discussion, right? You yeah, had for sure. Nancy Reagan, just say no. All that shit was happening. Those, you know, it was that was a big cultural moment. So to have somebody in 1988 say to me, "Hey, you know what? Like, first of all, weed's definitely gonna be legal in our lifetime." I'm like, I don't think that's no true. Way. I like, I remember how they, they, he was sitting in his apartment, he's holding a bud this big. And I'm like, okay, I like that. Let's smoke that. I can smoke that whole bud. And I still, you're not going to convince me that that's going to be legal in my lifetime. And now it's mostly there, right? But he also was talking about the psychedelic stuff. And he was like, this is my cause, right? I'm going to try to work within real legitimate government channels to get the FDA and the DEA and all of the, the, the appropriate authorities to re schedule some of these drugs so that we can start to a, a do research on them to prove that they're medically beneficial and then to start actually using them with people who can who need them right in 1988 and i was like rick i love you and i believe in this cause and i had done all those drugs and i love them all and i thought they were great and i could see like i'm not just from a recreational standpoint i could see what he was talking about i'm like i can imagine that a cancer patient or uh, someone Soldier, with PTSD. Yeah. These could be powerful things that could alleviate people's pain and help them to uh, help them to 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 heal. To, 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 to heal and to achieve higher understanding and all that stuff. But I thought the guy was fucking nuts to think that that was ever going to be achievable on a timeline that would be meaningful to me and him. And Michael Pollan's written a best-selling book about how it's happening. Yeah, like at the best medical schools, the best research institutions in the country are breaking through and saying, yeah, you know what? This shit's real. This is, this is, is going to work. It is therapeutic. It is legit. The harms are minimal, if any, and we need to change the laws. And, and the it, laws and are not changing. And it inspires changing. you. And it's inspiring, of course. And so the laws are changing and we're breaking through. And yeah. so, you know, I think, you know, it's like I've, I've given up my, my I, I always was hopeful about these, this, these achievements and this progress. But I was skeptical about it because I thought the culture would fight back. But I'm now, I'm like, you know what? Like, the progress is happening on all these fronts so much faster than anybody ever thought it would happen. And there's still a long way to go. But now I'm like, you know, I think we're going to get there. And, yeah. and, we're, and people who need these medicines are going to get them. And people who, 
who need them for who aren't even as extreme as cancer patients or or people with with PTSD. People are gonna like we're like the progress is happening. This is a place where there's a lot of fucked up stuff in our world, but on this front, you well, can think, see every day that things are getting better. They're absolutely. getting better. So well, I think that the the state of this country of the world, the state of consciousness that we're in is calling these things out, you know? Yeah. That's why people are being of drawn to these. need to um, realize that some things on this world that we can't explain. Well, exactly. have you guys, I don't know how much you guys have talked about this on the podcast, but what what got, what got made you start to experiment in this area? I don't know how much you guys have. You guys might and talk the, about this all the, the time. The I don't know. Psychedelics? Yeah. Oh, yeah, this what, is interesting. Have you guys spent time on this oh, on this podcast oh, yeah. a lot? We talk okay. about oh, it a lot. This is going to be so, very interesting. It might be rep- so it might be repetitive for some of the uh, listeners, but I'm interested. I no, just want to no, know. No, man, yeah. I want to know which, how you got there. Oh, listen, I'm I'm a, I'm an addict. I'm a really I'm a bad addict and I'm a drunk and um I'm a sex addict. Oh, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm addicted to everything. Okay? So, I'm living my life doing my cocaine, doing all my stuff and one day um I don't care and so we're doing a part like you and this guy's a doctor. Yeah. And he's talking about some kind of drug that's going to make me see God. 5-MeO-DMT. And this and it's going to like being in heaven. You're going to die. And I'm on cocaine with him. I said, really? <laughs> oh, is that so? And I said, where is it at? He said, I have it right here. Well, I said, well, give me check it. Let me check it out. Let's check it. He said, well, we can't do it right here. I said, why not? Because I didn't understand that kind of drug that you had to situate, you had to position yourself. I didn't understand that drugs is what you take in the street. You just take the drug right here and let's continue talking. I thought we were going to do it, but it wasn't that. <laughs> so he said, all right, wait. And so during our conversation, he's talking. I said, man, where's the shit? Are you ready? And he said, oh, no, wait. And so we go in Mexico somewhere. And, um, and he put some like, golden dust. It's like gold dust. He put gold dust in it and he, said, and he lit it and he said, inhale. And once that, once it came out, when, it was all cool. Once it came out, whoa! I, oh, I said, this is the first. This is what I said. Oh shit! I fucked up. These white motherfuckers killed me. I'm dead. Oh shit! Fuck! Why am I trying to prove I am dead? Oh shit! I'm dead. And um, I woke up, I guess it was 10 minutes later, and man, I just was so afraid. I didn't what know was what it? happened. What was the first thing? Well, what did you know what that was? The first thing you did? The first thing when it hit me? Yeah, what was the, but what was the substance? What was the thing you were smoking? It was sm- the toad. It was the toad, okay. 5-M-E-O-D-M-T. Okay, okay. And, um, yes, okay. Yeah. I seen um, Aztec pyramids. I see hieroglyphics. I'm seeing things. I'm seeing chambers of the past. I'm it's just, it's, I can't see myself. I'm, it's no, it's just energy. My body doesn't exist, and it's just noise and oh, you can't even, you can't even explain. My, I stopped breathing. I died. And I was telling the guy, I said, I'm not dead. Am I? I'm dead. I am dead. I? I'm dead. Right? I'm fucking dead. Keep it. You can be real with me. I can handle. I'm dead. Right? And um. I was so scared. Once I woke up, I said, where's my wife? Where's my family? I, I, where's everybody at? And I said, do they know where I'm at? Do they know I'm here? And I was just, um, I've never experienced anything like that before. I actually died, and um, I didn't know what to do. I just stripped me of my ego. I thought I was a tough guy. When it strips you of your ego, it's like ego killing. Um, ego death. Yeah, killing drug. And once it kills, you don't know, man. You feel so you don't even know what you're afraid of. You don't know what you think somebody's gonna kill you, fuck you, rape you, murder. You don't know what's gonna happen. And you just, fuck. You're happy it's over, but after it's over, you get that, um, them dolphins that feel like, what the fuck happened? And I'm just so happy to be up and I'm fucking crying, I'm holding people. And that's the first time I did it, right? Have you guys ever done a pod while you guys were all while doing DMT? I know. Oh my God. That's a. It doesn't last know. that long when you do the DMT. Yeah, help yourself there, John. No, I'm, no. I, well, I, I figured the tray's there for a yeah, reason, right? Course, I mean, I brother. looked, I considered that kind of a. I like haven't, a, I haven't done the toad. I've done DMT and psilocybin and LSD. And I think that. You know, anyone who tries these things, guys like Rick Doblin. Yeah. Had you tried psychedelics at that point? Yeah. You have? Yeah. I mean, to me, the experience is... I would say that has, by the time I was a... By the time I got to graduate school, which was that, was that 1988, so I was, like, I was in college in 19, 1983, 1987, there were not that many substances that you could name that I didn't have not tried, that I had not tried by 1988. 
There was probably some. Yeah. There was some. It would be on the li- on the list of stuff that there is to try versus stuff that I hadn't you tried. You tried a lot. The list was over here was a lot longer yeah. than the list over here. Hey, I get it, dude. I totally you know, get after that. After I did the toilet, I never wanted to do cocaine and the drink. I yeah, I mean, yeah. for me, it's something about these experiences that is so uplifting, connecting. You know, it dissolves the disconnection, the isolation, you know, in any way, even if you are alone, right. you know. But you've done, now you've done MDMA? Uh, I haven't done MDMA. All right, you got you to gotta make some progress. You gotta, we got to help him. I don't know. That's I'm like not really called to MDMA. That's like MDMA ecstasy, though. Right? You don't have to be. Yeah, you don't have to be called. I just, I just think you should. That's really, my vibe. You should though. broaden your experience. Yeah, it's a. It's a. You got one. Lo- one sure. life, man. One life, dude. I as mean, far as I know, I've been really. No, I think we're here a lot. Yeah. Oh, you do. You're you're a re- reincarnation guy. Well, I mean, yeah. Okay. You know. I think that's legit. Yeah. I just you know I think it's a it's an interesting thing about like if you believe if you are. I've always th- thought about the notion of like people who believe in reincarnation versus people who don't, right? Like what, how that changes your life, yeah. your life philosophy. If you think you're coming back, yeah, you have a different approach to I, things than if you think you're only here once, right? It's not that as much as- Do you think that's as, our ego thinking that we're coming back saying that? Yes. Yeah. I, do. I don't. I, I do. think that I do. the only way I can conduct my life is guided by the higher power that I've come to have a relationship throughout my life. Right. You know, and that's not, that's just whatever it is inside me yeah. that tells me when something feels right and good and when something feels off yeah. and wrong, you hey, know? And how do you feel, um, how do you feel that every, everything we learned since we've been a child about the world has been a lie? How do you feel about that? Uh, I don't know what that means. What does that mean? I don't know. You know, I'm fucking um Adam and Eve, fucking Christmas and all that bullshit and how this shit got with you know Martians came here and fairy tales <laughs> did this and my 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 baby my baby was born without a dick and come you know all that stuff. Well, I, some of those stories I'm familiar with and some of them I'm not. But um, I you know. Uh, <laughs> Some of those stories, like like the Santa Claus Christmas thing, I'm familiar with. The dickless baby thing, I don't know no, as much like about. That's, somebody, not, that's not what I know. Somebody about. being born without having. <laughs> no, I'm, I understand. I'm just. I'm just saying. I don't. I'm, I'm, I don't know, man. I think you know. Um, Someone would say the ego, the the angels blessed them with yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Bless these people. Yeah. John, so what is your take on life then, dude? Oh, come you on, think man. we're just here? What kind of a podcast? What, the, what kind of a podcast is this? This is like a fucking. I like. Are you my priest? My shaman? Which one? More like, like a what? shaman. Well, maybe. More, more like a shaman than a shaman. A shaman. I don't know, man. You're, I, this is not my area of expertise. What are we no, fucking no, here? but are you, are your feelings about this. My, my sense about my... But I, this I, ties my, into your overall feelings about the state of the country. Yes. Trump as a president. I think it fucking, is... The fucking, you know, abortion laws being put into place in 2019. Yes. All of this How shit is tied together. How do you feel about somebody telling a woman what to do with her body? Like, she's useless, that she doesn't know what to do with her body. I, I feel... She's a fucking puppet. I feel very strongly opposed to that posture, <sighs> and, and I find it really troubling that there's anybody who thinks that they should be able to legislate control over um, over women's or anybody else's bodies. Uh, so I'm I'm against that. How do... Um, who gives them the right to have even fucking authority over women? I, I, I think Why do women have a fucking authority, a fucking counsel for their own fucking living because they're totally two different species there's a question there's a question a lot of women are asking especially right now when they feel like they're having a lot of their rights constrained or stripped away from them for and sure i'm not a liberal guy you're not no and and if i really believe that you know women should have their people they should have, be able to live their own right and they should even have their own laws because we're fucking we'll violate them anytime we get a chance that's our nature as men to violate the weakest sex even right. the kindest men yeah uh I think I don't know. Yeah, what's the worst, what's our question? What's the question on the table? I don't know, John. I don't, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I just uh, you know, as far as here's my question. Here's, here's, here's uh, my question. Yeah, go ahead. Why does it matter? Why the fuck does it matter to stand up for what you feel is right if this life is trivial and you only get one shot at it? Why is that important? Well, I'm not sure that I, 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 I we're going to, to uh, 
th- this is like a you know not a political philosophy question, but a philosophy philosophy question. I, and again, I I claim no expertise to this, nor do I think anybody really could possibly give a shit what I have to think about it. But I will say that I think that that to say that you only are here one go round, and that there's no either reincarnation nor heaven or you know there's no afterlife. If you believe that you are here as a corporeal being, you're going to be here for however many years, and when you die, it's over. Your consciousness is done. You've finished. I don't think that's at all that the corollary to that is that life is trivial or that I think, you know, you could argue the opposite and that, you know, we are, you know, we have sort of profound obligations to our fellow uh, travelers on this planet for however long we're here and that, in fact, the, 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 the notion of life as a... Uh, as a finite thing sort of increases the level of responsibility that you have to uh, to take that limited gift that you have and make the most of it. And that part of making the most of it involves responsibility to your your kids, uh, if you have them, and your grandkids, if they have them, um, you know, to your elders who bring you up, that you have a, you have a, you're more, you know, this is, if you only got one shot at it, you've got to get it right. And, and, and I think, you know, the fact that that we as a species, I don't have children, so uh, I speak as someone as an observer of it, but like that we have that there are lots of people out there who have, you know, descendants, right? And that our obligation in our finite time here is to try to make sure the world is children? as good as it could be for them going forward. That like, so that, I, I'm not sure that I, that's I, my, to the, I, I think you can hey, feel though, right on. I think you can feel a profound sense of social and political responsibility uh, regardless of what your view is about these things, whether you think that they're, whether you're an atheist or whether you're a Christian or whether you're a Jew, whether you think there's an afterlife, whether you don't, I think all of those things still push you towards having uh, having a, a sense of responsibility, a collective responsibility to try to to make the the place that you are for you and your descendants and the species and its descendants to make that place as as habitable and sustainable and just as possible. Um, so that's I don't know. That's not a I don't I, that's not exactly a potted worldview for me, but that's. I think that's the answer. If no, you're, I think great? I think that's the answer if, to the question of why you should yeah. give a shit if we're only here for one life. I don't think yeah. we know anything. That's, that's what I think. That, I agree with that. I that think is... we don't know anything. I <laughs> yeah. was told if you take a guy that lived to be a hundred years old and he partied all his life for a hundred years, and you take a guy that discovered the world for a hundred years and that's all he did for a hundred years, at the end of the day, they both would know nothing about the world. This world, is, you know, is um. It's unknowable. It's, it's, it's inconceivable. It's inconceivable. I, I Absolutely. You know what it looks when you look at us on a, on a with a camera inside the um the atmosphere. And you see the other planets. It's almost like we're in a body. We're in some large body, and we're fucking probably a cancer or something in this body. Maybe. We're just yeah. bacteria. Yes. Because it's, it's, sorry to give you yeah. the impression. That I know this is like we're like man. No, John. I just you're you're the we man. We are bacteria. Dude. No, we are back. We are some nasty motherfuckers. If we didn't get those shots. Yeah. yeah. If we didn't get those shots, because right now we go to those um, Jawas, those guys that's in India on the island that's never seen men for like sixty thousand years. Seen, and if we go right there, if they don't kill us with the spears, we're gonna kill them in two days or two weeks because yeah. we're fucking filthy. <laughs> Yeah. And we and we have shots, we have shots, and we're gonna still kill them. Yeah, it's pollution. Yeah. So yeah. what's like? I, what's in the? You guys don't like when you have to do this this podcast. I looked at the at the many guests who've been on it, and they've it's, a, it's an awesome achievement. You guys have got this thing going. Um, there's some great conversations that have happened here, but you haven't had a lot of people in here who've like talk. You guys don't talk a lot of politics in here, right? No, it's not like a thing you do. So, like, I'm curious, like, what's your, you know, but I'm most down. most Let's people, do it. Let's do it. Most people in the country right now, wherever they stand on the spectrum, feel like have a very strong reaction to the president of the United States. Like, yeah. a lot of people hate him. Some, a lot of people love him. He's got, you know, but it's very polarizing. And and yes. and the, there's a sense for a lot of people right now, the stakes are really high, right? That like somehow this presidency is a little different. To go to your thing about like. You know how many chances you get. Like, why on, on some level you could, you know, you say, well, you know, the president change can change every four years. Why do we give a shit about any one of them? You know, there've yeah. been there've been a lot. There'll be a lot more. You know, anything's you know remediable down the line. And yet, for a lot of people right now, they feel like Trump is different. It's not like right. they don't look at Trump and say, well, here's a president who's kind of he's here transiently. He'll maybe do some damage. Maybe he'll be good depending on your point of view. But eventually, he's going to go. More people right now feel like it's a fucking four alarm fire. It's a state of emergency. Like the country's at stake. The, that that the gravity of all this stuff, that Trump, again, whether you love him or hate him, either poses a unique uh, capacity to cha- to make America great again, 
Or you think, like most liberals and I would say a larger number of people, just statistically it's true that there are more people who don't like Trump than like him, you know, who are like, this guy's a threat to American democracy. Yeah. He could fuck the whole country up and we could never recover. Yeah. So that's how people feel right now out in the world. So I'm curious, like, you know, what do you guys think about that? Do you guys think this is – do you give, I think a, shit, people, do you I think, give a shit about I think, Trump? I think American people panic too easy. They're quick to panic before they want to um, – what I mean? What can I say? Um, dissect the problem. Yeah. Oh shit! They're coming. Oh shit! The niggas are coming. Oh god! This. Oh god! This. <laughs> and um, we panic too much without <laughs> analyzing the situation. Yeah. And that's what I believe in. We and definitely I believe, that. And I believe Trump brings out of a lot of fears of us because we, a lot of people with that mentality believe whatever he says is true. Oh shit! The Mexicans are coming to get us. We need the wall. Right. You know, it's not because. You know, some people could look at Trump and say, this guy's a fucking idiot or something. And then some guys could look at him and say, he's right, he knows what he's talking about. Right. You know, but then they, the deal is, is that it's about you as a human being. The majority of the people work like this, because I was one of them fucking poor slobs. We, um, we, we have no information. So only our information is just the television, which is lies. And after the television tells us what happened, we go out in the neighborhood and we explain what the television told us and this right. is what's going to happen. Yeah. Now, is that just... um? Propaganda. Not only propaganda, but if that's just a, such a um, antiquated way of getting information and believing information, it's a whoa, you know. Yeah. The, it's the people, it's our minds that are uh, molded. We've been molded for hundreds of years, thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, and then we've been changing. You know, we go from slavery, we go from slavery, we go to surfism, then we go to um, communism, and then we go try to go to a capitalism, and then um. Capitalism poisoned everything. It takes communism, and now we're going to start selling things in communism. We'll sell pictures of Mao in communism. That, we'll still be communist, but that won't be bad. We'll live, we'll, live like, um, we'll live like capitalists, and that's just what the world is going to. There won't be no more. On communist is only a name now. There's no actual communist that's really happening in the world. You know, that's right. just what's really happening. Not in Laos, um, not in Cambodia, not in none of those Not places. Russia? No. What are you? What's Russia? Russia is the most capitalist country in the world, probably. But how is it run with the people? How is the economy? Uh, the economy is magnificent. But listen, they need to... Uh, wow. Ooh, I, I don't, <laughs> don't want to get there yet. <laughs> hold on, hold uh, on. Listen. I want to answer John's yeah. question yeah, from yeah, my yeah, perspective. I Please. I, the ti I think the title of your show, The Circus, Yeah. Is a perfect explanation of that, it. I was just explaining the circus. Yeah, so exactly. That's why I said what I'm going to I mean, about. so I was just explaining the circus. You know, to me, it's so for John, you, It's so just for, a circus to me, man. I, I do. It, I do, look. There's and, no. Yes, I told, you know. Yeah. I don't have a lot of faith in it, and I'm very skeptical right. of my government. Well, it's funny. Know? I think that there's a there's a lot um, like in that is like a lot of like you're not alone. You know, there's like millions of people like you. Like that's a more common, you know, I live in this world where we all take politics really seriously. And I think I'm, and I'll argue to the day I die that you should because it has a huge effect on millions and millions of people. But we, you know, for the people who like follow this stuff day in and day out, they have very, you know, various opinions about things, right? And various opinions about people and assessments and what policies they favor, or what personalities they like or don't, what they think is politically effective. In the end though, they all feel like, there's a caring about it that much, like knowing that much at a detailed level and having those views is sort of like conditioned on the notion that you think that it's a legit enterprise, right? That right. who's who, like that 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 these are the legitimacy of the whole thing of the whole game is inbuilt in that way of looking at it. But what I think is true is that if you go around and talk to a lot of people just in the country, they don't their their presumption isn't that. Their presumption is that it's all a fucking scam. Yeah. And that like this the, the system, you know, these are part of the reasons why Trump was powerful. Right. Because like him talking, you know, you talk about the system, you know, Bernie Sanders and and Trump are powerful in a lot of ways in, in a similar way, at least they were in 16 yeah. because they were like the system is rigged. Now, tr yeah. Trump is full of shit about most of it. Yeah. But but as a thing that people heard over and over again, which was, you know, I, the system is rigged. Everybody's kind of trying to fuck you over. And this whole thing in Washington is so fucking dysfunctional and so corrupt and such a fucking bunch of bullshit yeah. that what I'm going to do is I want to blow the whole fucking thing up. Yeah. And for a lot of people in 2016 who voted for Trump, it was like, and for Sanders, yeah. in different ways, obviously yes. totally different guys. Absolutely. And, and, but the set, that thing- I totally agree with that you. That visceral thing for a lot of people was, I know Trump's a clown. 
I know he's a fucking liar. He's I know he's not really a billionaire. Possibly. I know all that stuff. There are a lot of voters who felt this way. I know all the things that are fucked up about him. And even, I I know he says this racist shit about, about Mexicans across the border. I know all that stuff. But you know what? Like, if I vote for the other person, the same shit's going to happen. It's just going to be more of the same shit. And the last, like, 30 years has just not helped me very much. Yeah. It's not really working out really well. So I'm willing to accept, I mean, I'm speaking here as a lot of people who voted for Trump, I think, we're part of, like, I know all the problems and I know all the risks. I get that he's all yeah. those fucked up things. But the only th- but I'm I, at least he's going to change something. He's going to blow the whole thing up. He'll blow it up and we'll see what happens. I don't hey, think, but imagine I, this, guys. Imagine you're a fucking black person. And no matter who I vote for, I'm still going to get killed by the fucking cops. And another perfect example exactly. of, the, of the thing. So I think for a lot of people, there's just an element of like – the, their frustration with the whole process and their sense that it's all not on the level, that it's like it's a scam in some way. And that that's why people why so many people are are pissed and disenfranchised and dis and alienated from the whole thing. And it's how things like Donald Trump can happen yeah. is when there's a lot of people who are looking at the whole thing, just going like, of you know, course. this is bullshit. Yeah. So let's blow it up. So I, I, I all I'm saying is I think. That is, as you think about what's going to happen, people are not less pissed off than they were four years ago. Yeah, people are not less disenfranchised. People are more pissed off now than they were four years ago. All of the all of the stuff that was out there, frustration, the anger, the distrust of the system, the all the other fucking in, viscerally terrible negative things that are around in America, all of the bad shit is not better. It's just as volatile and fired up as it was then. So this makes yeah. it very hard. It's not going to be a normal election, you know, and Trump makes certain that it's not going to be a normal election because he doesn't give a shit about any of the rules. He'll do whatever the fuck he wants. So I just predict chaos. I guarantee you that anybody who's making like like certain predictions about what it's going to look like as this race unfolds. Yeah. Anybody who makes really certain predictions hey, about John. that is out of their fucking mind. Yeah. Yeah. Out of their mind. Hey, yeah. What do you know about your family? What, what? are you, Italian, Greek? Uh, that's a very good question, but it has nothing to do with Donald Trump. But that's probably for the best. Um, I'm an adopted child, so I, I literally I know everything about my adoptive family, but I know nothing about my about my genetic heritage. So you know, I, oh, this is interesting. You say that I always say to certain people and to myself because um, I did a research on something. I found something out, and it really freaked me out. Yeah. So. Um, I did a research on this guy, and his name was Alexander Dumas from, like, the French Revolution yeah. and stuff back then. Yeah. And he's a mulatto. He's a black guy, right? Yeah. His parents from Haiti, and he was in he was in um, Napoleon. He, even before Napoleon, uh, um, he was in other guys, too. The 16th, Louis the 16th, he was in his army as well. So, But he got in Napoleon's army when Napoleon got army. And so I did research on him and stuff, and his sons and everything. And then... um. When I'm doing research, he was a, he was a sword. He used to always go to war when the French um, Revolution hit the sword. And so I'm, I'm following his ancestry, right? I'm so awesome at that, right? So I'm following. And then um, I realized that um, in 48, uh, 48 and 40, 48, probably in the 30s, his family, um, they turned, they changed their name from Dumas, they married some Jewish family, to Oppenheimer. They become, they become, um, fencers. He's a swordsman in the war. They become fencers. They win Olympics. They're in the Olympics and stuff. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Incredible, right? Yeah. But isn't, this is what I'm saying. This is only 200 years. He goes from black. Now he's um, a white Jewish guy. Wow. So I wonder sometimes, who was my first bloodline? Male. Who was the first one? Where did he come from? Was he black? Who was he? You learned more about your family as you did, you know, various things over time, right? You For a long time, you didn't know very much. No, I didn't know and then, And then you found, like, you for, yeah, some of the, yeah. for some of the stuff you've done in media, you yeah. kind of, like, looked at it, right? Me and I'm on my... Um, Half brothers did a lot of research. Yeah. yeah, and so what's like what of all the stuff that you learned about your family? Uh, what's like what was the stuff that blew your mind most? Education, musically inclined. I'm not educated. I'm not music- musically inclined, but that was forced in that bloodline. Right. And so most of these guys are teachers, mm. musicians, and stuff like that. My son loves music. It's from genetics. Right. It's it's awesome, my mother man. was a teacher. It's just what it was. That's what they did. That was important and. Their life during the Reconstruction, education was poor, important. Entertainment was important to them. You know what I mean? My brother was the first guy to enter race, um, that enter race, that integrated football in his school in North Carolina. Mm. In football. He was a great football player in high wow. school. That's awesome. 
That's great to learn all of that. Yeah, seriously. I mean, that's like. Uh, but what I saw about my, from parents, my family liked the party. They always were out. They like dressing up, looking nice. Or it's, you know, they're very southern, so they got their money on their birthday. They tape the money on their their clothes for their birthday. So you see money for them celebrating somebody's birthday. That's cool. Very country people. Very country. Well, Mike, you're not formally educated, but you're an educated man. That's probably my insecurity for not being formally into. And I'm educated. I wanted to just know everything. Everything I know, I realize it's a lie. But if you know it, just knowing a lie is knowing something. <laughs> you know, just knowing these lies is make you somebody. Just because they're lies, everybody knows there's lies. But if you know them, you're cool. <laughs> I know nothing but a bunch of lies, but people think I'm smart. I, how am I smart? Because I know lies, right? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, I understand that. It, yeah. Um, so where are we? Where are we? What do you want to go? Know, what do you want to talk about, man? Anything. Wait. I had a question before. What about that. the lady? What's her name again? Which lady? This is going to be a close election. You yeah. know, Trump could easily get beat and Trump could easily still win. And there's a lot of ways it could go either way. I, I mean, I really, there's no, there's, it's, it, you look at what happened last time. You look at all the stuff we talked about before about what's going to happen this time. I think there's, you know, that you could easily imagine a series of things unfolding where Trump is able to win because for a variety, for a variety of causes. And there's just so much anti-Trump feeling out there. Why is it important there. to you, Democrats. John, who's president? Uh, because I think the person who's president is, uh, in the end, exerts uh, not, not sole power, but an awful lot of power over a whole bunch of stuff that affects pretty much everybody in the country. You know, like there's, you know, federal policy of one kind or another, there's nobody in the planet who's not affected either adversely or beneficially by yeah, by listen, a bunch of federal policies. That's so I think true. That, that's true. But listen, if us, if us as people in America was collectively caring and loving for each other and cared for each other and, and saw people in trouble and went in and got involved with them and helped them get out of trouble, yes. we wouldn't care who was president because well, we could, we could str- um, um, drive off for each other. I think there's a, I think the, pre- I think the government, well, that's not a real world. I think the government broadly defined is going to, you know, in a, in a country of 350 million people, the government is going to play a big role in everybody's life, whether it's some people has bigger, it has a bigger role, some people has a smaller role, but there's, once you recognize that there's people who, who need healthcare, they need education, they need a bunch of really basic things, no matter what your vision of government is, maybe there's a world in a fantasy where everybody just collectively bands together and provides everything for each other. That's not been the history of any place I've ever heard of any place in the on planet Earth ever. So I, I'm all for people caring about each other more, for community-based stuff, for volunteerism, for We're people. not made for that stuff, though, Try, are we? Be honest. We're well, not made for we're, that we're, stuff. We have not, like I said, the history of the country is filled with violence, meanness, greed, nastiness, as well as altruism and optimism and and, pro- and progress they always it's exist easy in for balance us to fight than it is for us to be friendly though well we we do we have done both and it has been it's a seesaw back and forth and they both exist in the country at the same time there's like there's a lot of division there's a lot of anger there's a lot of hatred there's a lot of racism there's a lot of oppression and there's also a bunch of really great stuff that goes on for a lot of people who have like who are you know it's both right and so Given that it's both, and given the country's so big and so complicated, the government is going to matter no matter what. And if the government matters, so if the world the, pre- the, pre- the, pres- the president doesn't get to control everything, and he in fact has a lot of constraints on his power. If the president has enough power, even with all the constraints on him, to be able to institute a border policy in which migrant, immigrant, illegal immigrant, uh, undocumented immigrant children can be t- torn away from their Thank and you. were torn away from their parents and put in cages. Okay, so I think like. A different president wouldn't have done that. Yeah. And this president did that. So that's why, like, just, you want to pick one example why it matters who's president? That's why it matters who's president. Because yeah, that guy gets is... to decide some stuff that has a pretty fucking major effect on some lives in a very direct way. I mean, this is my worst And a lot of case. other reasons. <laughs> Listen, yeah. we're, we as Americans and stuff are always willing to give um, some kids over in Africa, give them Malaysia, a bunch of stuff, give people in Somalia. We're always willing to get them, but we're not taking care of our minorities over here. We're not taking care of our poor over here. Mike makes a great point. Not uh, the, I'm not about the foreign aid no, part. What the hell, what the hell we, we care about tra- these Africans, the Malaysians? Uh, what we care about these other countries? We don't give a fuck about blacks here. Why we care about blacks in Africa? I, I do Man. not think I do not think we have to in a in a in a world that's not. I don't know. I think we can care dude. about both, Mike. Right? Can we care about uh, both? We can care well, about we can care about both, right? We should care no, but, about but both. we, we don't. Though, both. But why don't we? Well, why don't, don't we? That's a deep question. Why I don't, don't know. We? I don't know the answer to that question. But I think that you know why are we gonna keep getting killed from cops to the end of the fucking world? My great grandkids are gonna see cops kill black people. Can I tell you my theory on that, Mike? I don't disagree with that. Mike, you know, just like 
the black community has its scars yeah. of the past that lived through Mike's it. brought it up a couple times today. So Rightly do so. white European descent Americans because this country or that group of people for the for the most part has failed to acknowledge the horrors of many past actions yeah sure that this country is built on and so refusing responsibility over any of that gives us this psychological i don't know prison but that when we built we, when, around when ourselves do, when do we when does it stop is it going to last for another 2000 what a hundred thousand, a million years are going to continue to go. Are we going to ever learn? Maybe when both sides can reconcile the, the past. I don't know if that's something that's you know possible. The, you know what the answer is? 350 the million toad. toads. Like, you know, you get the toad. 350 million toads. Widely distributed toads and, and the practice of licking them could, could change a lot. But in terms you, of the outlook. Why are people so, so predictable? Why are people only certain ways and we know they're that way and they can't be any other way? But look, I agree. I'll tell you what I what you said a second ago that I agree with is, you know, the reality is that, like, there's a lot of people who, you know, no doubt, like, look, you know, you start talking about historical disadvantage, historical oppression, historical rape and pillage and plunder. The African-American community got are way ahead of everybody in terms of having been fucked over by America for a long time. There's no doubt about that. But your yes. point, though, there's other point, which is, you know. I think it's at least part of your side. point. Probably that part of your point is that there's, there's, yeah, there's definitely a flip side. But there's also, you know, you can there's there's disadvantage and no, you and, have to look and, at it like this. See, I understand what you're saying, but like, and I understand what you're saying about your white. Listen, white. Um, I mean, if say say you're a white um, immigrant and you come here, you're an Irish guy. If you make it. You can get some flakes, yeah. and then you made it in society. I, th- th- like I said, there, I think there's no doubt that there's that, no more pain. No, I, there, there's, yeah. no, no. there's no doubt yeah. that as a class, that as a class, that African Americans are like but more. But why does it doesn't stop? Are more fucked over. Stops? Wow, dude, man. Why does it never stop? Mike keeps asking me these existential questions about, like, you know, like that I don't have the no, answer. No, you have the answer. Why is it never? I don't have the answer, man. I don't you know. Have a theory. Why do no. humans? Why, Mike? Why do humans? Why did? Why, why does every human that's ever lived on planet Earth have like some kernel of hatred in his heart or her heart? Like, you know. Hatred mm. is, is a, it's, there's, as far as I know, in the history of, hu- of humankind, you know, there have been, you know, people, there's been hate, you know, it's what it is. You know, I don't know why that is. I don't know. I mean, I, that's a, that's a, that's a different level question. But the reality is that, you know, the f- division, op- oppression, anger, violence, crime, uh, you know, sexism, racism, that stuff has characterized every society to one degree or another pretty much has ever been on planet Earth. I don't know why it is, but it's a persistent why feature. Why we can't learn from our past and uh, fucking re- make a different life for our, for our future? Well, I think a lot of people try. A lot of I people try. So. A lot of people are trying to do that, and, and some, yeah. people, some people less and some people more, but like, I, you know, I think there's a, you know, it's a, it's a struggle, right? So it's the constant struggle. It's not going to change anytime so soon. So what do you think about, um, so your, your job, is to, your show, The Circus, right? Yeah. So what is your basic um, synopsis of The Circus? Well, you know, we basically do a show that's a, a, on Showtime that's a, a, a weekly real-time documentary about politics. So, you know, the, we've, we started out in 2016 as a campaign show. We were covering the presidential campaign on a weekly basis. So we would go out every week at the beginning of the week and we'd shoot with a bunch of crews and shoot all week long. Our, our show's not like, we don't do like archival, historical. We're like in the moment of that week. So what we shoot from Monday to Saturday is what goes into the episode that you see on Sunday. So it's not live television. We're obviously, we've got four or five often crews out shooting eight hours a day. And we're sort of making, as we go through the week, we start out with an idea of what the episode is going to look like, but as events occur, we adapt to the world. So we're trying to both do sort of like tell you what happened last week in politics that matters and also kind of tell you a story. So it's not just like a news digest of like, here's a list of important things. It's like we're out trying to sort of stitch together a little mini documentary, but one that's alive to the world of breaking news and like what's happening in the world. So if Donald Trump does something on Thursday that changes the arc of our narrative, we got to pivot and kind of reorient the show. It, I don't really think anybody's ever tried to do anything like it before. It's a really, really hard show to make and also a, a, a really rewarding show it's to work dope. on. Um, and it's different. It looks different 
than is it international or just I love locally? That, man. It's it, we we only can focus. We're only we're focused on American politics. We yeah. we can only we only do that there. I think there should be. I think it'd be cool to do the circus in a bunch of different other countries. Like and I would England, imagine England's doing a trip. And I have a lot for like, ever since the Brexit thing started. I thought you know if I were in London, I'd be trying to make the circus <laughs> uh, a, a, a British Brexit focused circus would be a great thing to do. What do you think about that? The Brexit, what? the Brexit, whatever. Brexit. It, the know. Brexit. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a big fucking mistake. There was a, a sizable number of people, you know, the project of of integrating the various countries of Europe into a single th- structure was like a decades long project that has been complicated and some countries have embraced it more than others. Britain's always been a little bit on the edge of it. They've, and they feel like they're part of Europe, but kind of apart from Europe. And right. so the forces, you know, when they took it to the country and said, do you want to stay in the European Union or do you want to exit, meaning Brexit, right? It was a big deal and a very close vote, and a lot of people just assumed that the that the that the stay campaign, staying in Europe, would win. And then there was a surprise thing that happened in the same year that Donald Trump got elected. Mm. It you know there was a loud populist nativist argument, which was basically in the country saying, if we're part of Europe, Europe exerts too much control over us. We lose autonomy. They're trying to impose European values on us, and we want to be. We're Britain. We're Britain. We're, We're Britain. Britain. We got to be alone. We got to be. We we can go it alone, right? And the economics of it are terrible for Britain, and they're going to suffer enormously. And everybody who I think what happened in the campaign was the people who thought that staying in Europe was the right thing to do, which economically for the country's well-being it was the right thing to do, and the project of European integration had largely worked for Britain. But the people who thought that. Like sort of got lazy about making the argument. They were like, mm. "Well, we're obviously going to win." Yeah. Britain, has, Britain has so many billionaires that live there, and that is true. And a lot of them are not from a lot of them are not from Britain. A lot of them from Russia, a lot from Russia and other places. Yeah. Mm. So I think they got you know they that loud Trumpy yeah. like isolationist argument got was able to win partly because the other side kind of got lazy and, yeah. and, and complacent about making it, and now it's just been a fucking mess mm. because as soon as the vote happened. There was like immediately people said, did we really just do that? Like, mm-hmm. really? Like, what, I'm like, what the fuck? I mean, there was literally for about a week in Britain, there was a thing of everyone going. Hey, what about the wait, wealth gap? Wait a minute. What the fuck? Huh. What the fuck did we just do? Did we? No, that wasn't supposed to happen. This was no, supposed Britain's to like. really fucked up, man. So then they've spent now the last basically two years, like more than two years now, trying to like figure out like, okay, like how do we do this in a way that won't destroy the fucking country? Right. Like, you know, like, uh, uh, wait a second. Okay. We voted to do it and the vote was legit. But if we do it. The country's gonna just, they're gonna be fucked. So they've spent basically two and a half years unsuccessfully trying to figure out a way to be like, okay, we're gonna honor the will of the voters and we're gonna exit, but we're still gonna like be enough part of Europe that the economy and the financial markets aren't gonna collapse. And they have not been able to figure that shit out. That's the bottom line. Britain right now is more fucked up than America. I and like think- we've, we've lost it. We've lost a, prim- a prime minister who hey couldn't guys, figure it I out. Think no one knows. Is, the world is moving in a in a direction that we in, in a speed that we just um. It's inconceivable. It is correct. It is totally correct. Absolutely, it is the thing. Dude. The main thing that has characterized my career covering politics uh, for now since nineteen since nineteen eighty sorry since nineteen ninety basically nineteen ninety so twenty nine years. The main thing has been an increase in chaos, unpredictability, black swan events, shit people nobody said would never happen happening. Um, and and big, like, shocks to the system that made the pool of people who are interested in politics bigger, like thirty and 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 the polarization thing of people being definitively on one team or the other. Like when we were all growing up, people basically looked at politics. It was like, oh, we have a presidential election every four years. I'm going to pay attention to that really for the last two months of the election, from like Labor Day to, to Election Day. I'll pay attention every four years. It was sort of like the way a lot of people thought about Wall Street, right? Where it's like. You know, big, huge part of the American economy that I only pay attention when there's a crash or a giant boom, right? And and people basically were, many people were of the mind, whether you'd say, well, are you a Democrat or Republican? They'd say, oh, I'm a Democrat. But they voted for Republicans sometimes if they liked them or they were, right. ticket split, splitting happened all the time. Yeah. Over the last 30 years, like if you think about the Clinton election, then the the recount in 2000, the, Viet, the, the, the Iraq war, Barack Obama gets elected, Donald Trump gets elected. Every single one of those things was sort of a what the fuck moment. And 
the church of like who cares about politics just got bigger and it became more and more part of. We need a woman president now. That's that. Uh, many people will agree with that. And I'm certainly Absolutely. one. I'm certainly one of them. Absolutely. I think a woman president would be a great thing. And it's too way too long. It's way, way, way too long for that. But that thing of more and more people being interested in politics because it's gotten she crazier. She can't be that, like that lady in England, May. She can't be like her. Theresa May. Yeah, Theresa May, that's bad shit. Well, she did not do a great job dealing with the Brexit thing. But that thing of like getting more, more people caring because more shocking shit has happened and has been more part of the popular culture, that's one big thing. And then the fact of nobody now saying... I'm a Democrat, but I vote for a Republican. Everybody's like, I'm on team blue. I'm on team red. Right. And back in the old days, like when people like cared a lot about like for like inter like there's a, you know, a time when we were first growing up, like people didn't want their kids to get married outside their faith. Right. It's like, you know, you don't want to marry a Catholic boy. You don't want to marry a Jewish girl. You got to stay within the faith or within the race. Don't marry a black person or you can't marry a white person. Now it's like, you know, we got interracial marriage, a lot of it. Um, a lot of interfaith marriage. But what you now hear is this thing where it's like you what the thing that people care about is don't let your daughter marry a Republican. Yeah. Or don't let your son marry a Democrat. Like yeah. that's the thing that people now are like, oh no, yeah. no, no, no. I I don't really care who my daughter marries, but if she marries a fucking Republican. Hello. Did you see Arnold Schwarzenegger get drop kicked? Yeah. Drop where? Oh, show it, dude. Holy where? Fuck. Show, man. That's a dirty motherfucker did this, man. Dude, he got Fucking drop drop kicks. kicks? That's why I don't hang out in fucking Africa, man. That's so by, 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 by drop kicks, you mean like a physical thing that happened yeah, to him? Yeah, well, got... well, Mil Mascarius used to do the motherfucker. This, this is not like a. Uh... Look at the bullet coming out this guy. This some yeah, that's shit. crazy. Uh, <laughs> crazy. We were watching that yesterday. Bullet coming out this guy. I'm swatting a kick video. Look yeah. at this. Oh, dude. the kick video. Look fan. at all oh, this is bullshit. Look at this. Oh, he should shoot. Oh, they got they got to put this guy in jail, man. Look at this. Look. Oh, look at this, man. This is not cool, though. This is not cool. Look, at this. Oh, look how she's jumping rope. She's jumping her ass off. He's killing it. Look at that girl. Arnold Fuck. looks great. He does. Looks great. Oh, not now. Wait till you see in a few minutes. How you saw how that girl jump rope? That's incredible. Oh shit. Oh. Look at that. Oh, they got that motherfucker. Oh, they got him. They got that motherfucker. What like, kind of bullshit what the was that? Fuck. Uh, what kind so of that bull- guy ran up and kicked Arnold Schwarzenegger in the back of the head? Oh, you know, he's, yeah. a, he's in South Africa. You know, they beating his black ass. But right is that what happened? Jail. Oh, they're beating his motherfucker. Is that, is that what happened? Yes. Well, we appreciate you coming out, Mike's brother. A big, Mike, you're a big YouTube fan, right? Oh, yes. You love YouTube, Yeah, I right? love it. I, all night. All I'm night. Go, I'm going to leave here and go home and watch it till I fall asleep at like 4 in the morning. Or right. Just, yeah. just just YouTubes. Yeah. Like dozen video after video. Everything. Anything. I heard some statistics. I, I heard everything. I heard some statistic recently that you're like, of all the people who've ever been watched on YouTube, like in the history of YouTube, that you're like, like a, you have a pretty high ranking. He's like number three. You. On what? On YouTube. YouTube clips. I don't know about what are you talking about. You, you Most know, viewed person. Yeah, like the the you know, YouTube, right? We were just talking about YouTube clips, right? So I was I believe it's the case that because there's so many clips of you out there in the world that mm-hmm. among all the people who played video clips on YouTube ever in history, like you're pretty close to the top of the list of the most viewed clips. Because all your knockout clips are like have been circulating for years and years and years. I'm a pretty dark person. <laughs> you're a pretty I'm a pretty dark person. Who is the most... You don't seem like a dark person to me, man. Oh, I got some, yeah, I got some shady parts. Well, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I got some shade on me, dude. That I, that I don't, that I do not uh, at all, uh, I would not contest. But the shade, but you know... I'm not, I would not quibble with that assessment, but, um, for but, sure. But the toad took a lot of stuff away. The toad gets, showed me the light, man, I'm telling you. Didn't care about anybody, didn't give a fuck. Had girls, had this, had everything on the world, doing drugs, didn't give a fuck about nobody, all this shit, and I did the total, and I never saw those people again in my life. Never had no more, never did anything, never, it all was over. You're trying to, you're trying, you're, you're trying to get a stat here. Yeah, I'm trying to get, get some it? stats. You can't get a stat. This is I'm, bullshit. It's fucking bullshit. It's uh, the worst, man. Fuck this. You know, the, inter- the internet just really... Fuck this. I don't, this. I don't I can, understand it's what It's fucking internet. great, but it's also just... Bunch of, it's shit. really Do it's shit, really man. giant, huge it's fucking hair, hairball. Like yeah. a kind of hairball bullshit. Right? You know, a bullshit burger. Fuck. You get on there, you hey, try to... What kind of food do you eat, I just want to have, like, you just want to... You're like, I got a really simple question. I just want the answer to this question. I just want to play it, and it's like, and you can't get the answer you want. A simple thing. A simple Simple thing like John. You know, yeah. What kind of food do you eat? Man, I uh, I like um, food of all kinds, Mike. 
What kind of food do you eat, John? I, I eat, I, I do, man. I have like a very, very broad palate. So I eat a lot of food. Like, what do you mean? Like, am I a vegetarian? I am not. No, I, have, I'm I'm a, not I make, I'm, about- I'm a carnivore. Yeah. I enjoy uh, food of uh, a very low brow food and high brow food. You eat a lot of beef and I meat? I love beef, man. Love I love meat. a good steak. You? No. No. Mm-mm. You went vegan a while ago, right? Yeah, I'm vegan now, but I can't, you know what? When I, I was eating meat, when I eat a lot of meat, it hurts when I fucking shit. I can't shit when I eat a lot of meat. I can't fucking shit. You know what I think the solution to that is? What? Don't eat meat. I, I, I exactly there agree. There you go. Yeah. Done. I'm, I'm, I'm not Michael Pollan, but I, I know enough Simple. about nutrition. You know, it's if so I crazy. can't fuck shit, but if I can't shit, fuck. <laughs> fuck. If I can't fuck shit, <laughs> if I can't <laughs> shit, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> It's so true. Man, that is like that words to live I by. I swear, like that, we're done. We're done. This podcast right. is over. That's like <laughs> drop the mic. The, the mid mic. Hey, John. You don't, seriously. You don't get anything better. Can you don't get a better up. kicker than that. Yeah. That's like that's the end. Let's wrap this actually, up. Actually, it's probably the only thing for the podcast that she actually said. Thank you so much, man. Really thank you, Thank you, dude. Uh, that was really a lot love, of fun. This is like a good this is a yes, a good shit. You got a good you thing got going here, man. We love going to work. Mike. Great episode, man. Brother. One of the best, man. John, thank you if so much. Where I, can people find you? Yeah, information, man. Let if people I know. If I can't fuck shit, but if I can't shit, fuck. <laughs> so true. Yeah, it's fucking the best. Uh, you know, check out the circus on Showtime. We'll be back in the fall. Um, I'm also on MSNBC a fair amount, and uh, you know, like just you know, pay attention. Yeah. At Jay Heil on Twitter. At Jay Heil on Insta. At Jay Heilman on Instagram. J H E I L E M A N N. You know, follow me on social. I do some shit there. Not like, Check not out. like, not like these guys do. Monsters of social media. Oh, no love this. Way. Monsters. We, have, we of just want to know what life's about. We, not, we just want to put the positivity people, out there. We want to know people's people perspective on life because you know, people. A lot of people walk around here all day and they're living life, and then all of a sudden they say, "Wow, it's almost over. I'm gonna die soon. What the fuck is going to happen?" Yeah. Yeah. I like your. Uh, I like this next chapter in your life, man. Thank I like you. it. Good, right? I like it. I like it. It's good. I like it on a variety of levels. I like the. I like the. Uh, I like the self discovery piece. I like the toad piece. I like the business piece of it. It's like a good like. You're heading into a, a to an excellent new chapter. It feels like. Hey, listen. I never thought this would ever happen in my life. I always thought, oh, this shit. I'm gonna die soon. This is gonna be over, man. I'm gonna catch AIDS. Or something. I'm gonna get fucking shot by this guy by fucking his wife or something crazy like that. And um, <laughs> everything just came to f- no, really, guys. I Every, know, you know, brother. I know. Dude, nobody's, like, just, nobody's making funny about it. Dude, I laugh because it's just so amazing to hear you be so honest about it. Yeah, you know, and you crazy. put it so matter of factly. And so beautifully that it's just, it causes me inspiration inside. No, but you know what? Listen, I didn't know how to live. Yeah. Like, I was champ. I had money. I had every, all these, um, every day at my beck and go. I didn't know how to live. I didn't know what to fucking do. Like I said, it's one of the great American stories. Uh, I'm not kidding. It's, it's like it's true, true, it, It's a, one of the great American stories, and it's it, and it's not over yet, which yeah. makes Thank it God. like I love I love the story where the big question is what's going to happen next. That's Hell like yeah. that's the thing that propels yeah. propels every great narrative, and that's what I want to know about Mike Tyson. What's going to happen next? Fuck we're going to yeah. conquer the world, buddy. Tyson Alexander Rand. the Great, baby. All day. We're not turning back. Mike, maybe you're so interested in Alexander the Great because you're the reincarnation. No, of I, I don't know. Whoa. Listen. Boom! We're Listen, done. Close all the go. Yeah, we better go. It's lunchtime. We love you guys. Check we us out on YouTube. <laughs> Subscribe to our channel. Thank I'm Evan again, Britton. God. That's Mike Tyson. This is John Heileman. We're out of here. Love y'all. Peace. Peace.